Chapel is uh, unfortunately not far from this. If uh, you look from the uh, from the field uh, aspect, if you looked at the teacher status, status the teacher's salary. Uh, and unfortunately, um, what we're going to talk today broadly is the privatization uh, of the education field in Israel and Turkey um, with those two um, uh, high-rank uh, researchers. I will introduce them uh, uh, immediately. I'll tell you about myself a little bit. Uh, I'm the head of uh, the Direct Employment Coalition of Education. I'm a social activist and a con former contractor teacher myself. I have a second degree in education, and uh, today I'm no longer a teacher, but uh, I'm the head of a leadership center of a WITS organization, uh, and I work in the media uh, I bring uh, social issues every week uh, in uh, the national TV in Israel. Um, in Israel, um, there is a, in the last uh, two decades, we see uh, more and more uh, teachers that are employed not by the government, not by the Ministry of Education, but through NGOs or uh, companies or uh, city uh, daughter organizations, and they employ them, uh, many of them uh, in different, um, not under the collective agreement, which means uh, many of them are employed uh, by the hour, uh, effective hour, which means uh, if uh, the, uh, the lesson was cancelled for because of a trip, for example, so you won't get paid, or uh, they are being fired every year, uh, or they are not getting paid in the summer vacation, Passover mm -hmm. vacation, which can be three weeks, etc. They have to go and sign for employment, unemployment <coughs> money. Uh, they don't have a route in their career where they can. Uh, at, uh, be advanced and get uh, to hire, you know, as a, as a person where you have a career, you want um, every year to, to proceed and uh, get to a higher uh, rank in your career. So the contractor teacher doesn't have that. They cannot approach to a higher position in their school. I can tell you a story of uh, something that happened to me. As I said, I have second degree from the Hebrew University in Education, and I was uh, a teacher in the 10th grade here in Jerusalem. And one day I come into the uh, teacher's room, and there on the board, there is a, a sign that says, uh, we're looking for a vice, uh, ma vice manager for school, only for uh, teachers who are employed by the Ministry of Education which means that I, that I was a contractor teacher, couldn't approach to this, uh, to this job in my working place, um, which may make you feel uh, second rate in your working place. Of course, uh, you can imagine uh, what this makes uh, to the status of uh, the profession, and uh, of course it's, uh, the influence uh, is on the children, the parents, the whole system. In Israel, there is a, um, there is a big problem with this profession of teaching. Uh, it's been, uh, uh, there is a lot of programs that are trying to, uh, with, um, to withdraw good, to tempt uh, uh, good people to this profession. I'm a senior of um, excellence program in the Hebrew University that only if you have very good grades you can be accepted and be a teacher in this Hebrew University program. But then when you go to the field and teach, the reality slams uh, very hard. Um, now uh, this uh, session is, uh, as we said, about privatization. Uh, in Israel there are not exact numbers, but us in the coalition for direct employment, we counted the numbers that uh, there are, and we found that every sixth teacher is a contractor, contractor teacher. 
There are 24,000 contractor teachers, at least, for, by our estimate, the Coalition for Direct Employment. Unfortunately, the government has no uh, data about that. From here, I want to go to you, Dr. Varda Schiffer. Um, Dr. Schiffer, she's um, a former president of the of, uh, Mandel Foundation Israel. Uh, she also was the chief scientist of the civil service in the state uh, Comptro comptroller office. She was in charge of the oversight in the Ministry of Education. And today, Dr. Varda Schiffer uh, is a research director of the educational system in the local government, the Hazan Center of Social Justice, the Van Leer uh, Jerusalem Institute here. Thank you, Varda. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, before I start, I really want to express uh, the deep feelings of sadness uh, that I have and that accompany me all the time while we are here for what's happening in Turkey and what is happening here in Jerusalem. And together with the sadness, I also feel uh, a lot of frustration. Uh, and I hope that uh, somehow this cloud will uh, disappear. I don't know how, but my sympathies are really with you. And I'm really very grateful for uh, the people who came from all the way from Turkey at, uh, at these times. So yes, the story of the um, Israeli education system can be told from many angles. There are actually numerous stories uh, and whatever angle you choose to tell the story, it's actually a very sad story. Uh, it's tragic in a way, because the um, Israeli education system was established before the state was established, actually, as a homogenizing force, as the main tool to build a nation. And I think that what we see now and the roots, you know, were there right from the beginning, is a very, very fragmented uh, education system. If I tell the story from another side, you heard part of it from Professor uh, Michel Stavczynski yesterday, you know, everybody expects everything from the uh, educational system. The educational system is responsible for the uh, participation in the uh, workforce, for uh, violence in the family, for crime rate in Israel, you know, everything is put on the shoulders of the education system. Uh, and uh, people in the Ministry of Education feel this same kind of responsibility. And in fact, the other tragic side of it is that people in the Ministry of Education feel terribly responsible. Uh, they do not let go of a very, very uh, centralized concept of the uh, management of the, of the system while next to them and underneath them, you know, the system is disintegrating and they are sort of uh, holding on. So I want to start by actually saying two things. One, that instead of putting all the uh, responsibility for what's happening in Israel on the education system, perhaps we have to shift it and talk about poverty. But that's not my uh, issue here, so I'm not going to talk about poverty. But I want us to remember that poverty is probably behind a lot of what we see in the education system. And if we don't deal with poverty in Israel, and about a third of the children in the education system in Israel live below poverty line. So this is the main issue that we ought to talk about, but no, my issue is education. So um, the second general thing that I say that from all the various stories that we can uh, tell about the education system, of course I'm going to focus on privatization, but I'm also going to use uh, concepts and data that are comparable and that we all know. And, but, but we should remember that it's only one aspect for many aspects uh, of the system. So let me start with the uh, uh, question that Professor Galnour asked yesterday, and he asked, you know, did it work? Privatization, does it work? Uh, 
You know, do we have better systems, cheaper systems, more efficient systems? So um, these are the results of the uh, 2012 uh, PISA, that's the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, exa exams that the OECD uh, does across uh, the nations. It's uh, the Program for International Student Assessment, that's the uh, PISA. Israel came in, 19, uh, in 2012 34th out of 43 countries. Not a very good uh, result, but I think the main problem is the disparity between better achieve, achievers and uh, poor achievers and the linkage of this disparity with uh, social economic status. So uh, you can see that uh, in Israel, uh, the uh, differences between uh, Jewish uh, pupils in the system and Arab pupils of, of the system, when the uh, Arab population is considered one of the poorest population, is uh, 133 points in uh, the exams. So I'm, uh, today what I'm going to do is very, very briefly give you an overview of the very, very complicated uh, system. I'll start then with uh, the funding uh, issues uh, around uh, uh, the funding of the education system and talk a little bit and the privatization that followed uh, changes in the funding and uh, the, the consequences, four major consequences uh, uh, that uh, we see and we have data on uh, in the uh, education system. Uh, so I'll go back first. Let me just tell you very briefly uh, uh, a few things about uh, our system. Uh, the Israeli education system, as I said, was actually established before, before the state and took notice of uh, needs of communities. Okay, so we had an ultra-orthodox education system for the Ashkenazi ultra-orthodox uh, Jews who came from Europe, uh, very, very religious, <coughs> that was established during the Ottoman Empire. And with the very, very special allowances that the Ottoman Empire made for uh, community educational systems, meaning a very independent educational system. I'm saying that because that's how it is until today, and it's very difficult actually to renegotiate the system. So what we have today is in the early 50s, the government of the State of Israel tried to nationalize the system. As I said, the government saw it as a major homogenizing force and nation-building force, so it needed to nationalize it. But what it did while nationalizing it was to leave, in fact, within the, national, within the state national system, the public system, we have three uh, sections. We have the state non-religious section, the state religious section, and the Arab uh, section. An interesting point, these three come under what I will call the public education system. But it's important to notice that very, uh, a very unusual case in Israel is that the Arab uh, system is conducted in the Arabic language. Usually minority uh, school systems in other countries teach in the uh, uh, the major language. In Israel, the Arab system is being taught in Arabic. Also, because I'm sure the question will come, we are talking about uh, a population generally of about 22% of the population. In the education system, because of birth rate, the Arab pupils within the education system constitute about 24% of the, po of the uh, population of schools. So it's a sizable uh, uh, group of, uh, of people. Uh, uh, that's the state system. So non-religious, national religious, and Arab. And now we have uh, two semi-private systems. So one is the original uh, Ashkenazi ultra-orthodox system, which used to be completely independent and I'll talk about it later. And from the 1980s, in fact from 1982, we have a Sephardic ultra-Orthodox uh, education system which is growing very fast. And uh, so you understand already the first contradiction, right? 
a national homogenized force uh, uh, which, uh, in fact, takes into consideration the needs of communities uh, right from the beginning. So we have, if we have an internal contradiction uh, right there. Uh, the the uh, ministry, as I said, the system, no, <laughs> is, is very, very centralized uh, in its concept. Local authorities don't have any role. So now I'll go quickly over the, uh, um, uh, the uh, first part, which is the uh, budget. As you see, when we look at percentage of uh, the, the education budget from the um, uh, uh, GDP, uh, we see a constant. And the constant is actually higher. It's about between 7.5 and 8 percent of the GDP, higher than the average of OECD uh, countries, except uh, the uh, percentage of GDP is a little bit irrelevant in the Israeli case because uh, when you uh, look at the allocation per pupil, you see huge differences and Israel is very, very low. And the reason for that is, as you see, Israel has a very, very young population, high birth rate. Uh, as a result of that, in uh, uh, at the decade between 2000 and 2010, we have an increase in the number of, of pupils of 15%, while uh, average OECD is a decrease of 4%, all right? So that makes uh, a difference. But what I would say is that, all right, this is the situation. Also, I must say, the state is actually supporting and encouraging uh, larger families. So allocate more funds, right? It's not God-made shortage, but it is a shortage. All right, uh, so uh, of course, the state is resorting to uh, uh, funding sources, to other funding sources. And this tells us uh, uh, the uh, in 2011, the um, uh, national the, uh, expenditure of education, uh, according to the funding um, sector, and uh, you see here, 23.7% uh, is households and what I call, I, I know the term was used here, uh, NGOs, I prefer non-profit organizations, NPOs, because NGOs can sometimes be for-profit, and uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about the uh, NPOs. All right, so you see 23%. What I can tell you is that when we look at the uh, sources of funding, Israel has a very high percentage of private uh, funding for education, higher than the uh, uh, average of uh, OECD, uh, uh, the private from the national, right? The national is, uh, it includes private and public. The public part of the national expenditure in Israel is much lower than in the OECD. So now we are in a situation, and I'm only now beginning actually the privatization, we are in a situation of constant shortage of funds. And the Ministry of uh, Education, that's already in the 80s, I must say in one sentence, in the 80s, we had a major, major economic crisis during the decade between 1980 and 1990. There was a 22% cut in education fu uh, funding. But everybody thought that this was a temporary kind of uh, situation and things will become better. So what, does, what is the guiding principle of the Ministry of Education? It's an interesting guiding principle. We can discuss it afterwards. That's the idea that there is a core activity <coughs> and there is a non-core activity, right? And they will be fun funding the core activity. And you know the non-core, they'll somehow outsource or outsource the funding, outsource the, uh, the delivery of the service, it, it will not be under their uh, financial responsibility. The problem with that is, as you see what they actually defined as non-core, it's very um, questionable. I, I have discussions with them. 
about what is core and what is non-core, because I think a lot of these things that they decided were non-core are actually very core. And also, the other thing is that it shifts. So you can see, you know, one year this is core, the other year, year something else is core. So you can see already that we are going into a uh, blurring, as we, we discussed it yesterday also in, 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 in the uh, health services, a complete blurring between the private and the public, and also in a, a, a lack of, of uh, you know, uh, understanding over time of what is happening because things are, are changing so uh, uh, constantly. So what I'm trying to say, in the 90s, we are already in a sort of a sliding slope which has not been planned. So you, the, the policy is a lot of activities, some decisions, but a lot of contradictions between them, and you don't see it's not a planned reform of privatization. No, if you ask the people in the Ministry of Education, they don't think they've privatized. They think, well, on the margins, we have privatized, but you know, the core issues, we are still in full control. That's, that's the kind of uh, image that they uh, uh, project. So now in the 90s, I'm bringing that because it's another crisis. In the 90s, they issue a tender, actually. It's in a, in a, in a framework of a tender, where it becomes clear that they are also dividing the content, the curriculum, into core and non-core. So now they're already inside the, the uh, curriculum, and they uh, declare or they, they uh, uh, define the enrichment, what they call the enrichment um, uh, subjects, uh, as subjects that can be outsourced to other, both the fi financing and the delivery, and it includes music, creative arts, environmental studies, and you know, as times go by, it's more and more, and again, you can uh, eventually, what happens today, and uh, the state controller has written about it, and the, the uh, representative is sitting here as well, that enrichment now includes uh, enrichment of mathematics, or enrichment of English, you know, core activities. But I, I don't have time to say, uh, you know, what I would like to say, that it also represents a very, very neoliberal idea about what core uh, education actually means, because it, re it really centers on two issues, on the issue of uh, an education that will allow people to compete in the global economy, on the one hand, and issues of identity. And uh, it's a pity I don't have more, but bear it in mind because it did have uh, uh, a tremendous uh, impact on, on, the, uh, on the system and on, on, on the kids. So in the 1990s, after a decade of, of uh, budgetary cuts, and I just have to mention that 1989, we are beginning to receive uh, uh, a wave of immigrants from the former Soviet Union as a result of which the uh, uh, educational system in Israel grows by about 10%. It's a huge influx uh, of people. What we begin to see is parents from the middle class look around to see how they are going to bring back the enrichment to the curriculum of their children. And they were doing it in various ways, pay from their own you know, pocket uh, and, uh, or encourage the uh, 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 local authorities to get involved and, and do something. And then the Ministry of Education, as a result, by the way, of a report by the uh, state controller, uh, says, all right, we cannot leave the situation to go on like this. We have to regularize it somewhere. Meanwhile, this thing has been happening. So, uh, uh, you know, a again, they are issuing a tender, and in fact, what they do is to uh, institutionalize uh, the whole privatization uh, of the, uh, <clears throat> the side of the uh, parents and local authorities paying for uh, the enrichment. So now what was perhaps looked at something uh, which is temporary is now you know, has become very, very uh, institutionalized. So by the 1990s, we have privatization of funding and privatization of delivery of educational services uh, full-fledged. 
so now, four main consequences. First, uh, this is a long story by itself, because what we have as a result of privatization of social services in general is a growth of our third sector, the sector of the nonprofit organizations. I just brought you uh, a few numbers. Of course, it's in proportion. The whole sector grew, but uh, the la latest uh, uh, figures that we have, 2013, we have 7,059 organizations, nonprofit organizations dealing with education in Israel. They're spread all over the place. Some of them are foundations, some of them are deliver services, most of them get money from the government in order to uh, deliver services uh, in school. So that's one thing. People may tell another story and say this is the flourishing of civil society in Israel. Civil society in Israel takes upon itself uh, uh, roles in the area uh, of education as in, in other places. Um, here I have the figures of the national education expenditure by the sector that operates it, right? And that's for 2013. And look at that. We said before that nonprofit organizations fund 23%, but they operate 39%. So 39% of the operation of the delivery of services in the education system is done by non-profit organizations, not by the government, okay? 23% is the local authorities, mostly funded by the government. The government is left with 29.4% uh, of actual delivery, which is a very, very low uh, um, figure, okay? Perhaps the most significant figure. The other figure I want to, to show you is the, uh, the other uh, consequence that we have here is the possibility of semi-private schools in Israel, right? It existed already because it, uh, it was there with the uh, uh, ultra-Orthodox uh, system. So now uh, it's growing. And look at that. Uh, the public official system, including, as I said, the non-religious, religious, and Arabs, decreasing from 88.1% in the late 80s to 74.2%. And... Uh, 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 as we said, people uh, forecast that if it continues like that, it will be less than 50%. So here we have this Ministry of Education, very centralized, losing you know, its control uh, over the um, uh, system. Uh, I'll go here very fast. As I said, 20.6% of the uh, semi-private system is mostly the ultra-Orthodox uh, system, Ashkenazi, not Ashkenazi, but now it's 8% already, 8% of the more affluent middle class building schools for their own children, right? We can see that. A lot of privatization, as I said, occurs within the state system, all right? All these nonprofit organizations, they work within the state system. That's important to understand. I don't want to go into the... Uh, 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 exemption school because it will take me too long, but I just want to tell you that the previous Minister of Ed Education, who was there for a year and something, uh, tried to nationalize the semi some of the semi-private schools, and I don't know where it's now. What distinguishes them, the semi-private school, and that's the interesting point, is that they do not abide by the core curriculum, right? We talked about the core curriculum. So the semi, the ultra-orthodox semi-private schools do not have to teach the core curriculum. So that's the, main, the, the second main uh, contradiction. I said educational system, everything is on its shoulder. It, it's responsible for everything. It's responsible for participation in the workforce. And here we have a, a segment of the education system. Again, it's about a quarter of the children not studying the core curriculum, which will actually allow them to be, take part in the uh, uh, workforce, potentially. All kinds of things are happening. So. Uh, Lily started saying the third main problem is the status of teachers and the fact that teachers, because of the outsourcing of the enrichment curriculum, all the teachers who were teaching enrichment find themselves outside 
the uh, uh, place, in the workplace, and the uh, conditions that they worked before and become contract teachers. So these teachers can, ha can have their license, they can be uh, members of the unions and they are not being protected by the unions. Uh, and of course they don't take part, as Lily said, in the work of teams of teachers in the schools and therefore they reduce the possibility of actually improving uh, the school system. And the last, uh, um, um, Consequence is the involvement of the affluent local authorities in education. They compensate for the cuts. They bring in teachers. They uh, employ them through contracts, but they put in, they invest in their own educational systems. As a result of that, they actually widen the disparities and the gaps between the achievements of the poor children and the achievement of, uh, achievements of the uh, rich uh, I have th quickly three graphs which show you, if you look, this is the Arab and Bedouin sector in Israel. So number of weekly teaching hours in public elementary school, it's important because the elementary schools are really under, officially under control of the uh, ministry. You see uh, um, financed by external sources, you see the disparity. Uh, the, the red is the, uh, <laughs> two minutes, I'm finishing. The red is the uh, religious, the regular, uh, the black line is the average, and these are the Arabs. So you see the disparity, they don't get funds. Again, weekly teaching hours funded by parents, same thing. Uh, Arabs and Bedouins, none, right? Uh, so all and weekly are teaching hours funded by local authorities, same things. Local authorities are poor local authorities. They cannot uh, uh, actually fund the education. So when I thought pov said that poverty was the issue, poverty uh, is the issue. In answer for my, of my first question, I think this is the result. We have a weakening system. We have a de further decline because the decline of the status of teachers happened before. And we have uh, an education system with unacceptable disparities. Thank you very much and sorry for taking so much time.